Really excited about this week's podcast with me, Wes Berg, a man who has done more than most of us in sport. How are you, mate? I'm really good, thanks, Greg. How about you? Good. I think people are going to enjoy this little chat about you because you've uh, you've suffered, you've enjoyed, and you've uh, also dominated. So let's get it going. Let's do it. Welcome to the Body Science Podcast, bringing you everything you need, want, and should know about health, fitness, nutrition, and training. As always, the information contained in this podcast is for the information purposes only and is not designed to diagnose or be prescriptive to treat, prevent, or manage any injury, disease, or other health-related condition. Today's podcast is brought to you by BCEAA Ultra, our new all-in-one BCAA and EAA elite amino formula. This cutting-edge formula provides you with the building blocks for lean muscle gain and helps you work through even the most brutal training session. Not just a BCAA supplement, BCEAA Ultra delivers a full spectrum of essential amino acids in effective doses and is 100% vegan friendly. With a massive 5 grams of BCAAs and 7 grams of EAAs plus added L-glutamine, BCEAA Ultra is your weapon for lean muscle repair and maintenance, helping you recover faster from those punishing workouts. Welcome to the house of fit, happy and healthy body science with me today, Wes Berg, Ironman star, Ironman veteran, trainer to the stars and a man who has a really good story about surfing at Burley Heads. Actually, probably not a really good story, a really bad story, but a, a very interesting story about taking risks, change, resilience and all the things that come with being someone driven like yourself. How are you, mate? I'm good. I'm really good. I think that the situation at Burley was a very fortunate and lucky to tell you the truth, Greg. Although I'd be sitting here a little bit differently in front of you today. Absolutely. We would have had to uh, do a downstairs podcast because we've got stairs and you wouldn't have been able to come up them. That is true, mate. Mate, let's get in. Let's talk about you first before we hit that because that's a really interesting story. I remember you and I were at the opening of some sports bar and I actually didn't know that story and, and I do want to talk, talk about it today. That's why I said, can we can we have a chat? But mate, you're an interesting cat for what you've done in life when it comes to being the athlete and then being the, there for the athlete. Like not a lot of people make that journey from one to the other. So Let's go on. Like, tell us a Wesberg story. The Wesberg story. I guess I'm 40 years of age right now. I've got a beautiful wife and I have three lovely children. Mate, I love watching what your family does on Insta. Like, they are just the best groms in the world. Yeah, we're very, very fortunate and very lucky to have happy and healthy kids. Yeah. I guess to rewind back to you know being a 14, 15 year old kid on the south coast, I used to sit there and watch the Uncle Toby series and just love it yeah. and fantasize about being an elite athlete and being a part of it. And I guess that's where the dream was born to make the series to move back a little bit further i actually grew up in sydney in the western suburbs of milk para eh? i am a westie wow uh, shout out to everyone training out there at the moment yeah so i come from the western suburbs and i actually lived about a kilometer from the tip there in milk para <laughs> is that right that's how awesome it was and unfortunately but fortunately i know a lot of people might say how's it fortunate but my younger brother passed away okay when i was the age of eight and he was four and that pivotal moment in my life gave me the opportunity to become who I am today because I more than likely would have tried to play rugby league. My brother and father both played for St. George first grade. Okay. My dad was a fullback. My brother played front row prop. My sister played Australian National Basketball League. And I think my mum was just representing netball player and I was probably destined to do a trade or something around Sydney like that, grow up, play football, which I was horrible at. <laughs> I was like that kid that stood on the wing and they throw the ball and they hit him in the face because he wasn't watching. <laughs> Classic. My poor old man, I was the black sheep for sure. Yeah. And so, yeah, 1988, my younger brother passed away, unfortunately, and I moved down to the south coast of New South Wales, about two hours south of Sydney, and I joined a little surf club called Shlaven Heads, okay. which probably had a capacity of maybe 50 people in it. The nippers that I joined there probably probably had maybe 20, 15 kids in it. And I was very fortunate that I met a family there called the Millers, who my eldest daughter, Miller, is named after. Still today, Greg Miller, who is my best mate, who went through the Uncle Toby's, who won Australian titles, and his sister, sister Lily. And another one of my mates, Drew Cancross. And it was basically a squad of five of us. And I was very fortunate that I was in that moment of my life to be accepted into that opportunity from a small country town to find a sport that I was loving and driven at. And the journey started there. We trained our bums off in the freezing cold of July and August and September. We continually challenge ourselves, I guess, to get better, but it was something for us to do. If there was no surf, we'd always be happily to train. And when you're a kid, you just love it. And we just frothed and we couldn't stop. Thinking back to that, like you, you've, you've done more in sport than most people 
will. So you used to play on the wing and the ball hitching the head because you weren't into sport. Suddenly you moved to a beach. What made you click? Like, was it just the ocean? Was it the people? Or was it Honestly, I think it was just a therapy for me to deal with the grief of my brother. I still to this day, like when we go away in the caravan with the family, because we do it nearly, you know, every three weeks, I still find that my therapy. I still find going down the coast and walking through the national parks and around headlands as therapy. And it's what the ocean's done for me for my life it's the ocean for me is one giving me my life it's almost taken a big part yeah, of my I'll life talk about that soon yeah without that i would never have met jade i would never have been a professional athlete i would never train some of the best surfers to ever stand on a surfboard i'd never get to race in a competitive series for 22 years i wouldn't be sitting here in front of you right now if it wasn't for the ocean so i really in a in a great debt to the ocean mm. it's phenomenal and i mean any young kid in a small country town when you know like the stereotypes are is you just you know you get a job you kick a footy around you grow up you get on off go to the pub you go to the pub then you get a job and then Every Friday or Thursday, you're in the pub, and on a Sunday, you're in the pub as well. Yeah. I was lucky that I met these people, and I was lucky that I got, I guess, the desire and the tenacity from my parents to challenge myself to push yourself because, you know, there's there's 30 something million people in Australia, and to become a professional athlete is very, very hard task. And especially at an individual sport, mm -hmm. I'm not saying team sports are easier, but I'm saying as an individual, it's you or nothing. It's you can't rely on other people to do it for you. You have to want it more than other people want it. And I guess that's what I was driven to do and the fortunate side of the situation my brother passing away is that my dad has a saying that no days are bad days just some are better than other days and you wake up every day you, you count your lucky stars because you're here and your brother's not here so don't get me wrong I had days where I was a shit house trainer and I was horrible and I'd miss sessions and things like that but as I got older I'd realize that the opportunity of life I've been given to, you know, you can lay on a lounge or sleep when you're dead, so to speak. So that's why I've continually tried to jam pace so much into my life to give myself more opportunity, but to experience and expose myself to new situations. Before we kick on to some of the things you just touched on, you mentioned 22 years as a competitor, that's a long time to be an Ironman. Yeah, I think I was the youngest. I made it at 16. I think Dino Mercer, God rest his soul, he was the oldest. But I think I went for the longest. Dino had a fair few injuries. I missed two years. I missed one year with glandular fever back in the day when I was 19. And um, I missed another one, of course, when I broke my neck. So, yeah, 22 years. But... I mean, it's the things you learn, Greg. It's every athlete talks about, you know, their career, but it's it's what you learn. As you get older and you become a parent and you have young kids or you run a business or you work for employees or a part of a company, it's what you take and it's what's instilled and it's the discipline and the structure and the routine and how to deal with certain situations and even the coping mechanisms with different things that come up through your work life or your relationships or even like raising children. So, yeah, I, I take a lot from, I guess, the career that I've had. But, yeah, I've, I've, I've swam around and paddled around a lot of bloody caves. <laughs> and how do you keep that motivation up for so long? Because it's really easy when you get to a level and you get to, you know, the top five. What were you, number two at one set? From yeah, I never one? won. I was yeah. the bridesmaid. I um I finished second, a third, two or three thirds, a fourth, and then pretty much fifth and sixth in yep. the latter years of my career. So what made you? You get up every day and just keep going what was it in that head of yours that said we can do this let's do this because that's a long time to be a competitive athlete look you know what like everyone out there stares at athletes and goes oh my god they're incredible they're courageous they're amazing like it's so easy honestly <laughs> like don't get me wrong like to wake up at 4 30 and dive in a pool yeah. and swim anywhere between you know, 4.8 to 6.2 Ks is hard. But mm. if you got one of, one of the swimmers who that's all they've done to come and sit at a desk all day and work on a CAD file or a spreadsheet or enter data or do any analyzing, they'd be asleep within an hour and a half. It's where you condition yourself and people are talented at certain things, but you learn and you evolve. And it's a year in a bubble as an athlete. Like my scenario as an athlete was so different to everyone else's I raced against because I've always had a job. I've never been a sole okay. professional. Ever. I, I made the series at 16. I was still at school. Um, I finished school. I raced for, I think, two years. Then I finished school. I became the head salesman at the local bowling club. So I used to order beer for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good job. I, I, I actually had a tap of keg that worked the other week from Stone and Wood. Yeah. And I'm like, who can do this? I'm like, yeah, I got you covered. You got you covered. <laughs> nice. So I did that. And then I finished that. And then I went and did an air conditioning trade. So I was an air conditioning refrigeration mechanic for nearly six years. Is that right? 
It is. And then I um, had this dream of becoming a trainer. So I lifeguarded for a year while I did my credentials in Wollongong. And then I got my credentials, moved to the Gold Coast for six months to train for the Coolangatta Gold. And I'm still here sitting in front of you 13 years later. Wow. So that's 13 years ago you moved to the Goldie. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because I think of you as a Gold Coast guy. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just so, that longevity, isn't it? I've moved around a bit. But I mean, yeah, like to answer your question is how do you do it? But you enjoy it. And the older you get, the more appreciative you are that you've been able to do this and you love it. And I mean, everyone that knows me knows I'm not too serious. I've been lucky as an athlete to have a switch. My wife doesn't have a switch as a competitive <laughs> athlete. I can take losses and deal with it quicker than some other people. I realize I'm fortunate to be able to doing this because of the reminder of my brother every single day. And when I raced and I used to come in from some races and I'd be leading and someone would catch a wave, ask me, they'd run up the beach and they'd win. And I'd come in and I'd go to my dad, I go, You bloody kidding? Like, and he goes, Well, you could have been further in front, you got the wave ahead of you, and like this, and a wave that broke in front of you. And I'm like, What? And he goes, Don't whinge to me about a wave, mate. Like, yeah, you're alive. How good is that? So, you know, my dad grew up in the bush and He's naturally passed on a lot of those harder traits in resilience and your belief in what you think of. But I just loved it. I loved racing. I loved the challenge. I loved the feeling. I mean, look, anyone that starts their 12-week challenges or their gym programs, and especially now to COVID, are getting back to the gym, they're getting their routine back and they're starting to feel better and better. Yeah. And it doesn't take long. You, you sore a little bit, but then you get back in that routine, that structure, and you start to feel better and you see yourself and the endorphins flow and your improvement comes. And fitness, honestly, and I mean, I'm not saying this because we're on a fitness podcast, yeah. but it's the best thing ever. That's yeah. what I do with my kids. People get say to my kids, how do you make your kids walk through that national, like your kids walked 9K through that park today. And I'm like, but look what they got to see, mm. eagles and empty beaches and headlands and all these incredible things. And like, how can you not want to make life the best it can be? Yeah, that's awesome, mate. Speaking of life the best it could be, let's talk a little bit about the major change that happened to you after New Year's Day surf in at Burley. Yeah. Yeah. So not a big crowd because it's New Year's morning. It's the morning. It's like six o'clock in the morning. Isn't yeah. It? So I've got a four-year-old son now. So he's the constant reminder of how many years it has been because he was eight weeks away from being born. Wow. Yeah. So I um talk about throwing Jade on some pressure. Well, I'll get to that. But so I went down to Burley Point on New Year's Eve and I had about I think three light beers because I drove home that night. Because mm-hmm. I said to Jade, we we're sitting there with some friends and it was pumping. It was that swell of like 33 days of just amazing, perfect ground swell. Yeah. And I said, I'm gonna surf all day tomorrow. And she's like, Yeah, for sure, go for it. So I went home, packed the car, put four boards in, put some food in, put lots of water in, drove down four o'clock that morning, got a board out, naturally sun cream waxed, ran around the headland of Burley, jumped in Tally Creek. Tide was like pretty mid-tide, jumped in, got swept out, would have been maybe eight foot through Tally Creek now, so it was solid. Paddled around, caught the first wave on um, Goofy Footer, so I'm back in at the point, got clamped straight away pretty much, and then I'm like, the next one I've got a high line and like zoom in a bit tighter before I grab my rail, and I still remember so clear i was paddling back out the sun was just coming up you know it's daylight at 3 a.m on the gold coast yeah. in summer i was paddling back out and i saw this like double up which is the ones you want at burley and it had the sun coming through it so i was like this beautiful turquoise double up wave and i'm like who's going who's going everyone kind of put their head down i'm like guys idiots how can they not want this so i spun around and paddled into it and as i high line to kind of get enough speed i went to the top and there was a little bit of morning sickness on it from the northwest yep. and it kind of buckled and bumped and it threw me and as i fell forward i fell from probably the top of maybe a solid six footer and as i fell down i put my hands out in front of me you picture someone like kind of diving off a diving board when their heels go over their head yeah the hands kind of miss the water and they hit the, <sighs> with their head so oh. the water inside the sand i was maybe knee deep inside and i basically fell yeah kind of on the left side of my cranial head first and just kind of snapped my neck straight away so it was a weird sensation because i've been electrocuted before because of my sparky background with the air conditioning <laughs> it felt like i've been electrocuted so it went out of my fingertips out of my heels and out of my coccyx straight out of my bum so it felt like a zap and the snap was kind of like a dry gum snapping over your knee but that part was gnarly but the amazing part was is ever anyone out there surf belly point you get a really really strong sweep like even the best paddlers in the world can't, can't paddle against, against it, it. Yep. you've got to paddle out around it and it sat me up with my back to the south facing the north, which meant the sweep sat me up because I, oh, I okay. once it happened, I couldn't move my legs or my left arm. I can only move my right hand and arm. So the actual sweep- So you're sitting in the water and all you can move is your arm. My right arm, yeah. 
<clears throat> so I'm and it's eight foot. I'm sitting up. Well, I just caught a wave and did it, and basically the next wave went over me. But then I washed and I was sitting up, and the water's pushing my back forward so I can sit up and breathe. And never, still to this day, like has this ever happened? The next wave broke straight over my head. So basically, like I was in a barrel and spat me out the back, out the back, and pushed me oh. like at least three meters behind the wave with turbulence and got me out of the wave zone. And then I drifted straight away down because the current's so strong around the impact zone. So I. Once I got that breath, I could lay face down for a couple of minutes just trying to get sensation back in my toes and my left arm. Were you and wearing a leggy? <clears throat> I had a leggy on. So it's just pulling you at the ball, it's just pulling you along. I was so lucky I had my Ocean Earth leggy on. Wow. It, wow. Basically what happened was is the le- the board was tapping me in the side of the head because the leg rope was long enough for the board to be here and my right hand on my right side. So I pulled the board down and under my chest and then I had something to float me. So then I could use my right hand to hold my jaw and get a breath. And because I'd coach it- So early, your mouth wasn't even opening like- Well, because <laughs> everything, I couldn't move everything. It was yeah. just my hand. So- wow. I was lucky that I'd coached at Billy for the last 10 years as the head coach at Billy Heads Mowbray Park yep. that I knew exactly where the outside bank breaks for the club is where we train. Yep. So within three minutes, I could move my toes again. I could move my clothes and open my eyes. I could move and open my mouth. And the only thing that didn't work was my left arm. So I basically pulled myself back onto the board, laid flat, and then paddled myself one arm down the beach in front of the wide burger peak and just waited and then once the wave come i could hear it and it picked me up from there and pushed me all the way to the shore wow which never happened that's lucky too that if anyone knows burly heads that's really lucky so very very fortunate, fortunate yeah. for all those scenarios to happen very fortunate and then yeah i got to shore and naturally i'd realized i couldn't use my left arm i had all this pain coming down through the left side of my body my legs felt like i'd probably had about 400 beers on a big night wow and i was basically supported my my right hand up on my throat and just walk dead straight because it's New Year's morning. There's no one around. Mm. Like it's this is probably 4:30 a.m. now because I got in the water like at 10 past four. So it's so early. There's no one there. So I walked up the beach and saw one of the old guys at the surf club. I'm like, hey, you need to get me a collar on. So I was lucky. He had a key to the first aid room. I got a collar on. I was like, you need to drive me to the hospital. And he's like, oh, I can't drive. I mean, what do you mean can't drive? He goes, I don't have a license. So I, they took it off me. I'm like, call an ambulance. And they called an ambulance and they said, oh, they're going to be 25 minutes away because it's a shift change. Yep. And it was right at the time when they swing the shifts and they've been so busy from the night before. So I was like, what do I do? What do I do? And I guess it's just that athlete instinct to go, you know what? I, I can fix anything. Like, So I basically stuck my left arm in the top of my board shorts, my hand, and got him to open my car door, put the keys and start the car. And I got in the car because I had the collar on. I you felt, drive yourself. I felt invincible. So, I mean, if you think it from Burley, you just got to get out of the car park and onto Christine Avenue yeah. and then it goes straight through to the hospital. So I drove straight to the hospital, ran into like little concrete ballard and that's yeah. in the car park, hit that, stopped, got out, walked in. As I walked in, there was uh, a guy in there who looked like he had the biggest night of his life. And as I walked, in and he's like what are you looking at i'm like oh please no like please and don't hit like, me what are you looking at me and i literally walked <laughs> in the door and the security guards came over and had to restrain him and i walked up the triage and they're like you're right and i said oh i think i broke my neck and i like they come running out and got me and took me in, scanned me, and then sent me off to the um, GC Neuroward. Very, very lucky boy. That's a big morning. Extremely lucky, yeah. Mate, that is almost one of the greatest stories I've ever heard from someone who suffered a pure tragedy, like breaking your neck at Burley. That's that's a tough gig, let alone getting to the beach, then getting to to, to, to see doctors. Like, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit speechless at the moment. That's an amazing Yeah, I mean- journey. The way the sand gets groomed, it's like concrete. It's so tough and the current moves so fast on it, so it just compacts. So I think when I broke my neck, there was eight other people that broke in certain part of the vertebrae or backs or necks in that 33-day swell. Wow. Like I was super fortunate. There was another gentleman who broke his neck. He lives on the sunny coast. And we actually compared our scans and our scans are so similar. My, my break looks like a boomerang and his looks like an arrowhead. Mm-hmm. He's still in a chair now. Wow. And he's got two children as well at the time I had. So I'm very fortunate, nice. extremely. And I mean, it comes back to the ocean and to my background of what I've done because all the specialists and all the doctors said that the density all the way through my neck, <clears throat> when I when I hit my head, the density has taken the, the full brunt of the actual force and instead of coming into a spear shape, it's actually gone into a bend. So I'm very, very lucky once again. Yep. Oh, mate, that's a... 
And the, a- hard, the hardest part, honestly, like you look at that as an athlete, you go, you know what, you set goals and you kind of get through it. But my poor wife, like we had the two girls already and Tally was eight weeks away from being born. I was flat on my back on the floor. She had to stand me up, shower me, shave me, undress me, dress me, shower me, dry me. So, you know, and she's eight weeks away from having a baby. So, wow. yeah, it was that was the gnarly part for sure. But the coolest part about it was the support and the network of people that came together to help me out in that time. It was incredible. It was amazing, all the support that I got from everyone. You've got a pretty interesting story too about when you did actually hit the hospital and how your life changed dramatically at that moment too. So you've got to where you wanted to be. Well, you're looking at scans. Jay's been told how the surgery's going to go and then a friend of yours walks in and go, yeah, that's not that's not what's happening. Yeah, well, because I got moved to GC Neuroward, they were looking at the scan. They were like, look, the, probably the best outcome is we will fuse your neck. And I was so lucky at the time that a very good friend of mine, my mentor, and probably the best chiropractor I've ever met in my life chris prosser walked in long hair dripping wet sand all over his feet he's the wsl head medico for their team there he's looked after mick fenning's groin he's done joel's ankle and foot pretty much sees any of the best of the best athletes that come to the coast the guy's just a freak chris walks in and goes oh i'd like to look at those scans please and they put them up and he goes oh no we won't fuse and they go excuse me who are you (laughs) and i go oh that's my doctor (laughs) So but he's, he's wet too. Like he's been in the surf as well that morning. He's got sand all over him and he's he's run out when he's heard the news. So on the, the crazy part about that story with Chris is that <laughs> I was surfing at Burley. Chris was at Mermaid and I guess that's about maybe 7K apart. Yep. And just by jungle drum, basically Chinese whispers through the water from Burley all the way to Mermaid, he overheard someone say, oh, the Iron Man guy, Wes Berg, broke his neck this morning. He's like, excuse me, did you just say- they go, yeah, the Ironman guy, Wesberg, broke his neck this morning surfing Burley Point. He goes, when? They go, oh, early. So Prosser basically turned around, belly boarded the first wave in. He was lived like yeah, pretty much on the beach, ran down the street, got in his car, wet board. He's grabbed a T-shirt, no shoes, drove straight to the neuro ward, walked in the door, and he's got sand on and his feet. And he's seat. telling the doctor what's going on. He's got like yeah. hair halfway down his back, salt and pepper colored hair. Yeah. And he's basically straight away said, oh, no, we're not going to do that. So I was, it was incredibly lucky to have someone like Chris because I met Chris – when I was 16, when I first made the series, he was the first physician I saw that looked after the guys on the tour. From then on, we just kept in contact. And basically, he mentored me with one of my biggest parts of my life, opening up a gym and starting to train professional athletes. Yep. So to have Chris then come to my house every second or third day and then do my rehab for me, help me out, all the neuro, the laser therapy that I did, the adjustments to the rest of my body, the mobility work. I was just, it was like a godsend and I'm very, very appreciative and so lucky to have someone like that to come and help out. Mm. There's a lot of water-based athletes and I know that see him and they just say he's got magical hands. Yeah, it's yeah. freakish. It's, yeah. it's It scares me when I walk near him because <laughs> he can look at you and just go, oh, okay, we need to look at this, this, and this. Yeah. And like, Does this hurt? You go, no. He goes, what about this? You go, oh, yeah, <laughs> found it. Found it. And uh, he also helped you in another part of your life too, didn't he? Like a very exciting part that most of us would have loved to do. Yeah. I mean, dream scenario, right? Mm. I've been an athlete. I've moved to the Gold Coast to train for the Cool and Gutter Gold when it first came back. And at home on the South Coast, I'd started doing some work with some pro junior surfers and conditioning because I kind of realized that they really didn't have any direction. There hadn't been any evidence of how fitness and I guess mental strategy or toughness has helped surfers besides just heat surfing. So I set up a little gym in Miami Surf Club there and it was a little studio, it was like 66 square meters, it was tiny, but yep. it was perfect, it's all we need. And Chris used to send me clients that he would see in his practice to help with their prehab and rehab and help people get mobility and just a bit of structure of what they need to do then to take, to make me redundant and then to move on and continue on with what they're doing in their life. And yep. he'd send me a couple of like the pro juniors or QS guys and I'd see them and then he goes, oh, I'm going to send, like you'd say, I'm going to send Greg in like yourself to come and see you tomorrow. And he goes, what time? And I'm like, oh, nine o'clock. And he said one day to me, he goes, oh, I'm going to send Joel down. Like, what time? I said, oh, yeah, eight o'clock would be good. Like, I'll be out swimming training. And I remember sitting in the gym and Joel Parkinson walks in <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you're the Joel. And he goes, what do you mean? What, what, do you, what Joel do you mean? I go, Frost just said Joel was coming in, not with you. So Joel sat down and we basically nutted out there and then 
what you wanted to do. And it was cool that moment because naturally Joel being one of the most talented, gifted, smoothest surfers to stand on a surfboard with Tom Curran, right? Yep. Like style finesse. And I was like, okay, what do you want to do? And he goes, well, I've just gotten back from Mendaka and I was in the final and I was buggered. Okay. And I was like, what do you mean? And Mendaka is such a taxing wave. It's a wave in Spain. It's a long left-hander and you normally paddle against a current to get back out. And there's no jet ski assist in that day. And he was like, I was just buggered. I was just, I felt rooted catching a wave. And I was like, okay. What do, you, what do you really want to do? But And he's like, what do you mean? I want to get fitter so I can surf better. And I was like, yeah, yeah, no, I get that. But like, what do you really want to do? And he's like, well, I want to win. And I'm like, yeah, but what do you want to win? And he's like, well, I want to just kick everyone's ass and be the best. I'm like, so what, what's that? And he goes, I want to be the world champion. I'm like, there you go. Okay, got it. So that's how it started. That's how we started. So it was it was the most incredible, you know, journey because Joel came into the gym. We got a good eight-week block for him. Went to Hawaii and just set him up with a routine and a structure and educated him on what he needed to do while he was on the road and away. And I didn't go to Hawaii. He won the Triple Crown mm-hmm. um, that year. And then he came home and we had a, an awesome preseason straight through the new year. And then he won Snapper, Bells, J-Bay, all back to back. And it was cool seeing someone that was, you know, like at the end of the day, you have athletes like that and they're so amazingly incredible talented and you're not going to contribute to their knowledge of their skill set or what they do, but you're going to enhance it. Yeah. And the best thing to see from Joel, naturally, like I had JS, Jason Stevenson ringing up going like, you've, you've He's too big. You put too much weight on him. And I'm like, oh, he's actually lighter now than what he was. He goes, what? Oh, yeah, he's two kilos lighter than what he was before he started. He goes, but he's massive. Everyone's like, oh, he looks like an Iron Man and he's like like a robot. And I'm like, we've got like three centimeters of rotation on either side. I said, yeah. mobility through ankles, knees, everything had gone up, torso. So everything was a bonus and a, 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 a always in a positive that we knew. And that was the best part about it. Because I said, I'm not going to affect your surfing. I said, I'm going to help it. And the strength and the power that we'd run Burley Hill over the headland in summer. People are like, what are you doing to Joe? old barbies and he goes what are you doing goes, why are you running over the headland he comes and goes why are you running over the headland and i said i'll tell you what i said when you go to war and you've experienced being on the battlefield already and i said you won't second guess yourself and that's what it was like it was like a red rag to a bull i could yeah. honestly sit here today and say out of all the athletes i've trained he'd be the top five and i'm talking about iron man yeah. who that's that's their gear but i, I honestly say on one hand joel has turned up you know five times not wanting to do it <clears throat> out of six years wow he was just driven. He was motivated. That's he was what makes world champions. Incredible trainer. But I mean, you got to go through his story as well, as in he won a world title, but before that, he cut his heel off. He lost his best mate within Andy Irons the year before. He snapped his ankle. Like he basically, you've got you've got to win it to earn it, right? You yeah. don't you don't get given world titles. But Joel basically had to make one heat when he snapped his ankle, and it was a seventeenth, and he couldn't get a seventeenth because his ankle was so bad. So he lost that world title. The next year, you know, he cut his heel off. So he'd finished third, uh, second three times already. And it was just the catalyst of that, you know, that year in 2008. It was, it was an amazing ride. It was incredible. And then to have the likes to work with someone like Andy Irons and B. Durbridge and Dusty Payne and watch Jack, you know, help Jack Freestone win two world junior titles to train my idols like Oki and yeah. Brendan Margs and like to train Margo. Like it, it was a privilege to train all those guys because the fitness part is easy and they can get that from anyone else, but it's, it's, the knowledge and the touch of helping them how to fight the inner demons but also gives them confidence the beliefs in themselves when they're on the road it's it's a glamorous job everyone thinks to be a pro surfer but you live out of a bag 11 months a year yeah that's a tough gig you're judged like you're judged everything you do is performance you're a gymnast mm. like people are sitting down writing scores and it's emotional scoring it's conditions it's it's that minuscule of non-preparation and being prepared and having fuel and being hydrated these are all the things i went through because they were so green with it they didn't know how much water they should have through a day they didn't know how many meals they should have they didn't have like proteins and minerals and bars and that mm. was unheard of for those guys and kelly mick and joel were pretty much the only guys doing it and they were the guys destroying the whole field so for me to be able to pass my knowledge on from racing the Ironman series for so many years to go on this amazing journey with those guys, travel the world, you know, sit in the boat at Tahiti, get the surf chopes, get the surf restaurants at Fiji, be there for the thundercloud when the chopes was humongous days. Like those, that's crazy, you know. Like I remember being there that morning in Fiji. It would have been that 22, 20 something foot day, and all the big wave guys had flown in from around the world, and they put the event on hold and we went out there and Mick and Joel and I on a boat we've gone out and Makura Rothman was sitting across from us on a boat and he turns around and he says, hey boys how you going he's bored would have been 
probably 12 foot and it's hanging over either side of this boat <laughs> and he's waxing it up. So Mick and Joel jump in the water, they all paddle off and I'm like, guys are freaks because they're on, Mick and Joel are like on seven or six tens, maybe six wow. sixes, six eights. These guys are all on like, you know, proper like weighted down 10 foot, 11 foot, 12 foot boards. Yep. Mick and Joel go out and snap all the boards. Joel comes back to me and goes, oh, hey, I'm going to get you a jet ski to go into the lagoon inside to get the fins. I'm like, what? He goes, well, we need the fins for the comp and the comp starts. We've, we've broken all our boards. Mick and I got no fins left. I'm like, right. And he goes, you no can drive way. a ski, can't you? I'm like, yeah, I'm not Billy Watson. I'm not the water patrol. <laughs> he goes, you'll be sweet. I'll get your ski. So anyway, a ski comes over. He goes, can Wes go get the fins? So you just imagine riding a jet ski and being like, I'm six foot three. Yep. And you're going through whitewash like the size of, you know, 15 foot. And you've got to go in behind it. You get in there and you get to the tower. The whole tower that's in that reef is just rattling and rumbling and creaking. There's filmers up into it freaking <laughs> out. And there's like a board graveyard in there. There's boards wow. everywhere. There's all these boards because naturally the screwing fins. Yep. So I had to go in, retrieve the boards, pull all the fins out. Getting back out was one of the most incredible experiences. Nothing happened to me, but just to see the volume of the water of what, you know, just dispersing across this reef and you're looking up like football fields away and just seeing these tiny little ants trying to catch these waves and then to negotiate your way to get back out. Yeah, that wouldn't be on my top five list. I got back out there and I was like, you're all right. You guys are pretty blind. <laughs> and I'm like, how could I not be? Oh. So, yeah, but experiences like that, you know, and like <clears throat> seeing different cultures through Tahiti and Fiji and naturally like through Brazil and going to beautiful locations but it, it's always the yin and the yang right you get to see the best and the worst of athletes and you get to see the the disappointment and the frustration but to experience those moments of i guess pure finesse when you get to watch any athlete in any sport you watch who are good at what they do in like real life real time and i guess that's why as sporting spec spectators of the world seeing that pinnacle of any sport is just marvelous today's podcast is brought to you by collagen regenerate australia's first advanced collagen peptide for tendons and ligaments supported by intensive clinical trials research and a comprehensive ais study collagen regenerate sits proudly within the body science range as the most researched and most versatile collagen on the market whether you're a professional athlete functional trainer recovering from injury an endurance sports athlete, runner, weekend warrior, aspiring young athlete, or general elderly population, Collagen Regenerate has something to offer you. Exclusive to body science with 50 milligrams of vitamin C to assist in connective tissue synthesis, this product truly is in a league of its own. So mate, for those trainers out there that don't understand the full package you've talked about, and like most trainers that go, oh, I'll just get him fit, da, 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 I'll do what needs to be done. You've talked a, a major package that you bought based on your background and the things you've been through. What was a day like for you with Joel on tour? I mean, look, with, with any Olympic or high-end athlete, you have procedures. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest thing and your procedures you put in place, but it's formulas. And once you get your formula as a professional athlete, sounds silly, you just stick to it. And once you need to make changes, you make little tiny increments to change because if we don't change, we stay the same, right? Yep. So it was teaching those guys their procedures, but their formulas of how they ate, what to eat, when to eat, when to start thinking about a heat. People overthink things. That's life, right? People get anxiety. They think about it too much. It kind of captivates and takes over their world where we put cues words in we taught them diaphragm breathing techniques we taught them how to relax in situations it's pretty hard if you're an athlete like for me it's first past the post so i'm out there racing i'm in control of my own destiny unless a wave comes in my sport you run past spectators people yell out go greg not where's i'm like f that guy you know mm. i don't think of that i'm just concentrating on my procedure for a surfer they're saying okay well such and such is surfing it's just got an eight you now need an 8.5 there's two minutes left so you've got to think they're almost like brain Surgeons like yeah. they need an 8.5 or two minutes to go, they're waiting on Mother Nature. So, if they get the opportunity, they have to execute that under pressure. And that was the biggest thing I worked on. That's why we went and used to run Burley Hill. That's why I used to make my guys do things that other people didn't because it was the executing under pressure. It's that buzzer beater you watch you know jordan shoot like everyone looks at jordan and goes oh but you know jordan missed more buzzer beaters than he made in his career mm. but only people remember the ones he made yeah and it's being able to have the tenacity but also the belief 
to make that shot or attempt the shot. And that's the same thing what I did with the surfers is that cue words, the procedure, the breathing, and the belief in their performance. Because really, in all sports, it's a journey to get you there. And once you get there, really, it's a celebration of all the hard work. People get it mixed up. The hardest part's the training, the preparing. Absolutely. It's freaking hard, but you love it. But when you put it out under the microscope, that's what makes a good from great. That's when people can perform under that pressure and make those decisions and execute. So that was the biggest thing I worked on with those guys, not to be too concerned what's going on. It's about what you're doing. And naturally, you know, like those guys are so talented you can basically prescribe or they could prescribe how to go out and surf the heat. You know, like the hardest thing with someone like Joel was he was just so excited. Like he he's a proper frothing surfer. Surfer heat at Snapper and it'll be four foot. It's the first heat. And he's like, oh, I just can't, like, can't wait. Like, and I'm like, you only got to catch two ways, mate. He's like, yeah, I know, but like look at that one and look at that one and look at that one. I'm like, yeah, but you only probably got to get two sevens to win the heat. And he goes, oh, I could get nines on that for sure. <laughs> So it was cool to watch someone like Joel go out and go, I'm going to get a six and a seven in this heat. And anyway, I've got to get more, I will. And yeah. you just do it. And yeah. then the next heat, you go, okay, I'm going to get a seven and maybe an eight. And you'll do it. And then you continually build through the heats. And it was cool because where my sport, you expose yourself straight away to get up the front. Yeah. You spend your bickies, you set up in a pack, and that's how you push to stay up there to be in contention for the win. Yeah. Someone like these guys, they surf a heat, they might go on hold. But if you surf two heats in one day and you get a nine and a 10 in that heat, the judges who are emotional, like gymnastic judges, sit there and go, oh, you got a nine and a 10. Oh, that's not what he just did before. Oh, I'm going to give him a six of that, where it probably was a seven or an eight. Yeah, got you. So that was the biggest thing, like learning to also control the emotional intelligence around the situation and how people thought and what their perspective was of it. You kind of go too big, too hard at the start, then you expose yourself and people, that expectation always has to be met. Mind games. Yeah, that's Every it. sport has yeah, it. Yeah, I know. Just looking at your eyes and going, oh my God, like he is so enthralled in what he's saying here. Like that's just a flashback. And he went on to um, create a fitness app and everything with you. Like he was right into what you did with him and put his name on a fitness app. Yep. I yeah. mean, look, it was new for surfing. Yeah. And the best thing about it is we've seen so many young kids get involved in fitness and it's going to give kids pathways and opportunities to go into fitness fitness avenues to be involved in different Absolutely. sports but also not to neglect their body and give them something i guess it's to take and use as a procedure for the rest of their life and be able to fall back on that skill set that they've developed but you know that time the hpc center down at casserine had started which is an amazing facility you know which all the australian kids have access at that talent id t- tier group but yeah. yeah we built an app um we just thought it was an opportunity one to give people exposure to what we did and the biggest thing as you know and as everyone else out knows out there People just want to be told what to do and how to do it. And if it's easy and simplistic, then they'll do it and stick to it. Hardest thing is writing programs and then making sure it's balanced and coordinated and then doing it, you know, want to make the easy part. The training, the hardest part should be getting there. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it was cool. It was a great experience to, you know, train all those guys. I did the Billabong Junior team there for a while, the talent ID. Um, you know, like I was lucky enough to train Andy Irons on his comeback and to see someone that was the most rawest and most powerful athlete in that sport and being so vo- vo- vocal and so proud, then I got the total opposite side of him, you know, coming back from his rehab and working through the rehab and his training and the, the questioning himself and being this giant to then becoming this tiny questionable person as an athlete within himself to rebuild that you know and his one goal for the rest of his life was was to win another CT event and you know I could sit here now with any surf fan and say I'll bet you a million dollars Andy Irons will win Chopu in two foot hardly breaking ways they'd be like you're kidding yourself mate that's not gonna happen that's what he did trained his ass off lost a lot of weight got rid of a lot of demons you know got clean got pure really worked on his mental composure and you know three-time world champion like the roughest toughest like the guy that stood up to kelly the guy that you know like basically schooled kelly like don't get me wrong kelly slayed the best surfer of all time 11 world (laughs) championships you know like but for Andy to come in win three in a row off the bat yeah it was remarkable and the way he did it and you know like to say he wanted to smash someone like kelly's pretty little face and comments like that you know that's putting yourself out there yeah and to have to see that as a kid and to be like, whoa, this guy's gnarly. And then to come to me and it's like a little pussycat and to be able to work with that and to see that harmony grow and just that belief again and that desire to want to surf, but not for anyone else, not for sponsors and not for fans, but for his wife and his baby that was on the way, you know, and for his mates like Joel, because if it wasn't for Joel, I wouldn't have ever worked with Andy. And that's how I got involved. And these guys become like part of your family because you spend so much time with them and you want to you want to see them, you know, achieve. And like I said to Andy, I said, 
light. You've got to want it more than me because when I want it more than you, that's when it becomes an issue because it's it's your dream and your goal. So you've got to own it. I love that. And but that's what happens with coaches, Greg. Like when coaches want something more than the athlete, that's when friction and energy happens you've got to be coachable and that's the biggest thing with anyone like i've had many of athletes come in and i'm like hey you're here for you not for me i said i can give you everything i can the skill set and people go oh but i'm not that good i go this is amazing i said if you came in here perfect what would you want me to do for you Mm. i said if i can help you become better at what you do i said we're winning i said the worse you are the better it is right so to get someone like andy and to have him so raw and to come back and build up his confidence get his strength get his mindset just get his belief but the biggest thing was to make him happy it was cool it was so amazing you know like our wives went through their first pregnancies together like so he'd train and they'd go train together and it was just cool you know to talk about coming a father for the first time and to experience all you know like the scans and things yeah. like that so very very special time in my life like for sure it's yeah. it's it's definitely something that i think i never thought i'd experience you know like you know watching people win bells and j bay and being a part of that and watching junior world titles and even to train someone like Ock, you know and margo like I was a kid, Margo was like- oh, Wasn't he an awesome surfer? Oh, he still is. Yeah. He rips. But to have Margo come in and have Oki and Margo in the gym training together, like, was just sitting there going, oh my God, this is like crazy, like, you know? And to so just to contribute to people's careers and they may not go out and be world champs, but they'll be better at what they do and hopefully they take the things that you can pass on and they can utilize them in their life. They can look back and reflect on a time and go, hey, you know what? I did that. I pretty much can go and do it again or I've done it before it wasn't that hard i just need to start here and at the end of the day as a coach you do you want like i said at the start you want to become redundant you want to be able to teach these people what you know your knowledge skill set and pass it on for them to come out and be independent individuals with what they're doing that's awesome are you still coaching now no i don't you don't coach coach my family wow (laughs) you've got a couple of um screaming athletes there too just quietly or it's uh that's what they're going to be a little competitive family as it gets older and older. There's some rock stars and superstars in those three. You know what? <laughs> if you want anything for your kids, you just want them to be happy and balanced. I get totally get and that. That's I appreciate the thing. that. You know, uh, their mother was a professional athlete. Yeah. I was a professional athlete. So, of course, you know, we watch a lot of sport. We enjoy it. We love to watch it. It's it's our life. And we're very adventurous. Like, you know, like you said earlier, we've got the Jayco Caravan. We're ambassadors for those guys. Yeah. We're always away. You know, it's just teaching them to slow down and, you know, watch the wind move the trees and the trees dance in it and watch the tides come in and out and those things but it's also a fierce game of footy on the beach yeah <laughs> i love it and i hear on the tennis court too yep they love tennis they absolutely love it so we're still working out if we're going to be pro surfers or pro tennis players i know you don't want to talk about that because that's not dad's mindset but i don't know if anyone what, what is your family's instagram account it's just i just have mine and jade mm. has hers yep. jade suckliffe and wesberg and mm. the girls have one but i if mean if you want to see some kids ripping on surfboards like seriously i just watch them surf and go oh, they, they're just awesome they come in they're frothing like I just I, it's not just oh, I'm a good surfer it's like I love what I'm doing and yeah. you see that over and over again with your family I mean Jay did PR here at Body Science for a long time and I still get her to do a lot with us and, and yeah. Liam she just and I just you two are just great people in sport you know sports really lucky to have had you two mm. I mean we're lucky to have the opportunity and being guided by the right people Jay yeah. had an amazing coach in Scotty Thompson Yeah, he raced for a lot of years in the Uncle Toby series he's like you know a second father to Jay and with mine with Gerald and Miller she was like a second mother like very fortunate to have good people around us to support us in those adolescent times you know like mm. i grew up in a small country town and the head magistrate used to always say keep him in sport i'll stay out of court yeah mm. nice good words you strong know? words so but i mean with the kids honestly mm. like with the ocean everyone says to me like oh i just can't believe how much you swim and push your kids around on boards and like take them on paddle boards i'm like it's a skill for life mm. I, we're so fortunate that, you know, Australia is infatuated with the ocean. If I can pass on my skill sets where my kids can body surf, surf, paddle a clubby ski, paddle a stand up, paddle an OC1, then I want them to be able to do it all because if they travel around the world and go anywhere and someone goes, hey, you want to paddle out to this outer reef? They go, yeah, I can do that. Or, oh, yeah. hey, do you want to do the Molokai crossing? Oh, yeah, I want to do that. I think it's just giving them the skill set to know that they can do things. Speaking of Molokai, you've actually had a crack at that, haven't you? Oh, I have done Molokai, mm-hmm. yeah. How'd you go? It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> I've um, threatened to do it four or five times. I probably should go and look someone in the face sitting on the other side of the table and say, I need a coach. But I am. Um, Molokai, so Molokai, for those people out there, Molokai is a 50 kilometer race from Molokai Island to up Oahu on Hawaii. And it's the most prestigious paddleboard race in the world. Mm. And it basically has continued to go because it is the heritage and history of the inter-island traveling between the Polynesians. So that's why the race is still done because they used to cross inter-island 
through trading mm. and that's what it was and it became a race many, many years ago um, in the olden days. So, yeah, well, look, we've been sport in Australia because we have this rich history of Ironman racing that paddles similar boards and we had a guy here in Australia called Jamie Mitchell mm. who phenomenally won it 10 years in a row. Absolutely. He's a weapon. Inc- incredible. Mm. Like, mm. amazing. Like, so, you know, he trained on a guy called Mick DeBetter and Mick won it three times, I'm pretty sure, and he trained Jamie as well and then they kind of just took over the whole world of paddleboard they were day and night between everyone else so jamie was going for his 10th year and i thought you know what it's probably a good idea to try and race the guy that's the best at it and have a crack at it so i went over and had a crack at it and did the training and a friend of mine zane holmes who was probably the most accoladed eye man in our series um had done it and he got second to jamie and he said to me you know what because it's not like anything we've done because you don't stop at all you don't change craft legs he goes you paddle for about five hours across open water so the year i did it i, I trained my bum off and got prepared and got organized and we got there and you start on this island and I always say this to people like they go what's Molokai like and I said well the island's pretty desolate there's not much there and you come down and you kind of stay in this old bankrupt kind of resort there's not much there you go down in the morning you got your board ready and you've warmed up you've had your proper brekkie you've used your procedures and your formulas and you've had your drinks and you got your goose and you got everything organized and give them to your boat guys and you walk back and you stand and you go okay I'm going to smash these guys <laughs> Stand in the big circle and they go, okay, let's hold hands and say a prayer for safe crossing of the channel. You stand there and you're still thinking, oh, I'm going to kill these guys. (laughs) Everyone holds hands and one of the Hawaiians come out and they do a Hawaiian blessing on the whole field. Everyone bows their heads and then they have the blessing. He says, oh, just raise your head and just look around and just know that everyone's going to go through a different challenge, a different journey today. Some are here to be competitive. Some are here to cross it. Some are here to help them get through situations in life. And some of people are just here because they're able to be doing it just as he said they looked across there's a guy sitting in the ground everyone else is standing he's sitting look at the guy and go why not why he's sitting down and the guy goes okay thank you and i'm looking at the guy two guys come over pick him up carry him he's disabled no. carry him over onto the shore i walk down and i'm watching him they put him on a board they strap his legs and his butt basically to a board and he paddles off to the start line I walked over to mike takahashi the organizer i'm like hey mike that guy and he goes oh yeah where's he this is his fifth year he's disabled he cannot walk i'm like he paddles he goes oh the whole way i go solo he goes yeah i go he's not in the team he goes nope i'm like oh my goodness so right then just resonated with me like how amazing humans are yeah and then i went back to trying to smash jamie <laughs> <laughs> how'd you go i got smashed by jamie <laughs> <laughs> i um, i had an interesting race we actually did a doco around it called one touch we filmed the whole kind of training period and getting ready to go there but we, our boards got there they were left on the tarmac at um honolulu they delaminated we had to get them fixed oh. got them fixed got to the star line started off first two and a half so the, you have an escort boat and it can't come to you within 40 minutes so you take enough water for 40 minutes because they're coming because you got you have to have an escort boat beside you yep. and they've got your food and like your gels and your bars and your proteins and your water sun cream hat sunnies everything you can think of they've got it 40 minutes goes jamie and i like neck and neck with another guy called brad gall gall and him are flying and i'm like oh my god it's way faster than what i thought like i can't believe they're going this fast gall goes one way jamie and i go another way and I get to about an hour, Jamie's boat comes in and they're like swapping over his drink bottles, giving him a goo and I'm paddling. I'm like looking around for mine and I'm like, my boat's not here. Keep paddling, hour and a half, Jamie and I still side by side, boat still hasn't turned up. Jamie's boat comes back in, reload him, everything like that. And look, I couldn't really go, hey guys, can you swap my drink bottles out? Like It's like, you know, prepare to fail, failing yeah. to prepare, right? Yeah. So anyway, two and a half hours later, I steered off a different direction. Jamie, I could see across from me and then my boat turns up and I'm like, where have you been? I've had no fluids for the last hour and 50 minutes. And of course, it was a bit more um, explicit than that. <laughs> The boat driver who's Hawaiian who we hired goes, oh, Jerry Lopez's ski broke down and they radioed me to go and get it because if I didn't get it, I would get my ass kicked when I got back to the mainland. Fair enough. And I'm like, <laughs> "What? I've just, we've, we've hired a helicopter to shoot this today. I've spent all this money on a docker. Oh. I've trained my ass off. 
the ten time cha- nine times champion is like right there. And then he was like, we need to change course. And then it was almost like when I got my goo and my fluids, it was like I dumped. It was like the opposite. Yeah. Where it just was too much and it saturated me. I think I might have been better off to try to just have a little bit of electrolytes mixed in with water, but I just took it all straight away and it was like I just hit the wall. Yeah. And then I just kind of from there fumbled and bumbled my way through. So I mean I made under five hours my first go. I finished third that day or fourth that day. It was an experience, but I went back and did it with Joel. The year Joel won his world title. Oh, the same year. The same year. Yeah. So everyone was like, You guys are crazy. And I said to Joel, it's the best thing. Like it'll keep you focused. You won't think about the title. He's like, Yeah, I'm in. I'm like, really? You don't want to think of that? I talked to Monarchy wife. He's like, No, let's do it. So we flew over. It was like he had the U he had to go to the US Open two days later. And you should have seen the rashes on the poor bugger. <laughs> like covered head to toe in rashes at the US Open. But I mean, I've got a photo of Joel at home paddling into a swell because it gets really big out there. They just swell and his chin's on the board and you can only see a part of the board so it looks like a surfboard. It's like an eight-foot swell. Wow. We did see a team of foot tiger shark that day because the way you swap over in the team is you jump Jumping in water, yeah. you jump in and wait and then the paddler paddles up to you and you swap over and Joel's paddling and he's like, get in, get in. <laughs> just wait, just wait. He goes, what do you mean? I go, just wait. He goes, paddle right side the boat. I go, okay. And I pulled him and then I go and he goes, what are you doing? Mate? You should have seen the size of the shark. <laughs> just, <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I've done Molokai twice. It's it's a great experience. It's incredible. And yeah. I mean, it should be one of those things that people put on their bucket list because the color of that water is amazing, you know, and to see a 10-foot tiger shark. But to see people like, you know, 13-year-old family, like part of, you know, 13-year-olds doing it with their families, paddling, it's um to, you know, to do it with Joel for him to his world title that year, distraction, yeah. you know, all the training. To try it yourself and challenge yourself and just put yourself out there, I think that's the biggest thing, to try something different and to be exposed. But it's actually a goal of our families. We're all going to paddle the channel together. Oh, is that right? But I said to Jay only last week when we were in the caravan, I said, I think this t- we might have to do two teams. She's like, what do you mean? I said, well, there's too many of us. So, yeah, it's it's one of our dreams to do it as a family. Wow, that's cool. Mm, that's be rad. Cool. Be really rad. Yeah. A lot of people talk about doing it. I've spoken at many beer-infested fireplaces about doing it one day. Let's jog on from that too because I still got to do a marathon as well. So, we'll keep moving forward. As I've I- never done one. Haven't you? No. I tell you what, training for it's hard. I bet. You do a lot of kilometers. I kind of feel like, and I mean, I don't mean this to be a smart ass, but I kind of feel like I just want to do a little bit of running and just go, yeah, I'm just going to do it because mm. I don't think I'd want to go for a time. Oh, I wasn't worried about time. I was just worried about finishing. I yeah. did many 15s, 17s, 20s. Oh, you're there? No, long way from there. Just going to go again. Yeah, <laughs> long way, but it's uh, – it's it really takes its toll on your body because it just oh, it's, it's brutal. Yeah, it's they're they're freaks. <clears throat> People like doing those type of sports, uh, they deserve everything they get. Like that doc on the breaking two. Have you seen that? No. They break the two hour. Like oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Amazing, right? That's just far gifted. out. Gifted, gifted. But you watch you, you watch runners and you see some people when you run a lot. You see a lot of runners. Oh yeah. There's people who can run naturally shouldn't run, and I'm that. Like I'm not naturally running, but people just run past me, and I just go, "That's just beautiful to watch." It's mm. Like running is is actually pretty. It's like surfing, you know. You yep. look at, people think, "Oh, running, running." It's not. It's no, just it's see not. run and run. Yeah, yeah. the yeah. gait and the foot strike oh. and the composure and the breath. Yeah, yeah it's and amazing. the breathing. Like it's to me, running was more breathing than anything because I could not get enough oxygen in. <laughs> 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 They're bricks just coming at me, going swallow. <laughs> Mate, so what's next for you? You're working in the surf industry again. Yeah, I'm um, I'm lucky. I've got an amazing job. I um, work for a surf brand called Bissler. I work under an amazing human called John Mossop. He is a good man. Yeah, he's um, it's crazy how intelligent that human being is. Yeah, he's the man you reach out to when you're actually got problems. Yep, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> he um, so I've been lucky enough to be under his guidance, and other good humans come into my life, and I've been able to, I guess, be utilised in a skill set with him. So I kind of do a lot of things in there. I we're a small business, so I'm a bit of a firefighter. Anything that John needs a hand with, I jump on, help out with retail or marketing or the team or even with the operations, yep. the events as well. So, I mean, we're a grassroots brand and we've seen an opportunity in the marketplace. We're not going to compete with, I guess, Billabong or Rip or the high performance side of it. Now, wetsuits are the second highest selling wetsuit in Australia at the moment behind Rip Curl. Got a couple of those. But yeah, I mean, look, we sponsor a lot of the, uh, the QSs in Australia. So, to be a part of something that gives opportunity to athletes, it's like coaching. It's like 
mentoring for the women for an example we sponsored two events last year on the qs and if we didn't sponsor them the events weren't going to run yeah, so okay. we're lucky we've got a good very good relationship um like family with john schmook from surf new south wales we love schmoo schmoo's a legend yeah. yeah he's a very very good human and basically your next schmoo just so you know mate <laughs> and basically schmoo and luke madden put on these incredible another events. good human too yep yeah put on these uh, amazing events with their team down there and we got involved and the girls that qualified on the tour this year, six girls out of the 10 needed the results from the two events we sponsored to qualify for the World Tour. Is that right? Changing lives. So, well, I mean, it gives people opportunities. Mm. It's a pathway. And with the QS, we do the Summer Surf Series with Surfing New South Wales, the Bissler Series, and they're all the 1000s. So, it gives all the grassroots community from the journeymen to the young kids who are trying for the first time to be a part of it to give them the opportunity to compete and, I guess, expose themselves to the competitive industry of pro surf. Nice. So we love it. John was like an Emma Shield winner when he was a grom. Um, he's a competitive swimmer and runner as well. So he's very competitive. He loves it. And I mean, they work tirelessly on the business, John and Jen. But I mean, that's small business and it's growing and we're in an amazing position. What's the website for that company? It's just Vistler.com. Dot com. Yep. Yep. It's an amazing company and we just do it a bit differently. We look at, you know, like the avenues of, you know, like keeping it simple and creating product that is for surfers and people utilize it and use it and they love it. Yeah, nice. I want to come and talk to you guys about designing some training shorts for us. Yeah. You've got some pretty cool eco friendly materials that have caught my eye so we do we we hold ourselves very highly on sustainability mm. massively so we're the only company in the world that uses a brand called cocotex yep and our board shorts are actually made out of coconuts yeah. so it's pretty cool they come from coconut husk fibers collected from around the world mostly indonesia off cocoa farms up there so that's, that's pretty good. rad yeah yep. that's good you know all of our products now i've got blends with um poly bottles in them as well and um, nylon fishing nets yep. so look i mean it's the way forward for the future it's the same thing you know with um, packaging and products and i've been fortunate enough to be involved and do a lot of work with yeti now and their products are crazy it just yeah. it just eliminates and the coolest thing is is that it gets passed over to my kids and it gets passed because yeah, you took plastic out of your family didn't you we're plastic free yeah, yeah i mean where we can be there's, yeah there's, i can't tell you how much i respect that i've spent the last six weeks and every year i do this for a couple of months i try and get us out because you can only do it at certain times because you're locking the contracts and do things you do yeah. i try and get us out of plastic oh my god like well, it, I mean, it is. Or I try and reduce the fl- the plastic footprint. Or yeah. there's some new plastics coming now that actually biodegrade. No, yeah. no splinters, no nothing left in the soil in ten years. Hopefully, we can get those into our range this year. I don't know if that will happen based on the way things are going, but it is an absolute mission. Even like the water in our, you know, trying to get cardboard box water. Try try and yeah. do that. It's impossible. I mean, look. I think Greg, like yourself, like the industry you're in, it's people expect to have it in plastic mm. because I think it's cleaner and more sanitised and safer. And yeah. I mean, you've got to abide by you know a lot of rules and regulations. I don't think we're going to eradicate it straight away, but mm. it's if everyone can make a change, it's just that it's honestly if we can all change a water bottle, yeah. if we can just do that, if a billion people can do that, then we're making a massive impact. Absolutely, and it's just the little changes, you know. Glad wrap, like turtle killers. That's what my kids call it. Yep. Turtles can't see it. They eat it. They eat jellyfish. That's yeah. what they eat, you know. My son last night ran Tally Creek together with the only silly people there because it was freezing and windy, <laughs> but picked up a jelly and it was silhouette, it was clear. And he's like, oh, this is like um, glad wrap. And I'm like, yeah, that's why we don't have it. And he's like, oh, okay, turtles eat this. And yeah. like, tiny changes, if we can all do it, then our sustainability footprint is going to go up. We're going to get ticks and, yeah, we'll be all better for it. Oh, I absolutely agree with you there, mate. Absolutely agree. Thanks so much for coming on, mate. I really enjoyed that. That was an interesting chat. My pleasure. Thanks yeah. for having me. No I hope, hope people out there found a little bit something interesting and we've motivated them, inspired them to change something or do something different or yeah. push themselves a little bit harder in some other avenue. Yeah. So your Insta game was? It's just Wesberg. Yep. yep. One, one word? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I knew he was going to say that. <laughs> but, yeah, thanks for having me. And um, yeah, believe in yourselves and enjoy what you do and take a step back and breathe. And mate, you know what I loved about that little chat we just had? A lot of those athletes you talked about, we've touched as well in our journey over 21 years. It's just such a good place to be, sport and fitness. Mm, yeah. yeah. It's incredible, isn't it? It We're is. We're very, very blessed. Yeah. Catch you soon. Thank you. Today's podcast was brought to you by our partners in Fit, Happy and Healthy, ASN, Nutrition Warehouse, DY Discount Vitamins, Fat Burners Only, Evelyn Fay, Mr. Supplement, or find a retailer online at bodyscience.com.au forward slash retailers.